Well, my first time to SNA, I got to tell you, it's exciting. <laughs> um, I've been to Tailhook three years in a row, and this is far more fun. <laughs> it really is. So I don't see Tom Roden in here. Is Tom, Tom are you here? If, you, if he is, if he isn't. Um, my thanks to Tom for the invitation, SNA for the invitation, Secretary Garcia, great to see you here. He's, he is my pseudo boss in the, in the ASN world and he's a fantastic teammate in trying to push things in a direction that's different uh, and, and hopefully you, you get that message today when we talk about some things. Uh, I, 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 w I do appreciate the fact that when I showed up here this morning there was a, a membership card to SNA waiting for me because I understand Admiral Davidson uh, bought everybody, every JO out there who wasn't a member, offered him a free, free one. So I took him up on that. Thank you, <laughs> Admiral Davidson. Um, so I, my, my primary goal here today is to put myself out of a job. And uh, hopefully at the end of the day, you'll see why. That is unless you want to see more uniform changes, especially a new SWOTR in the future. I'm, I'm gonna, you gotta keep me on the, on the job for a little while longer. But after that, I, I hope what you see here is that we can put the Bureau out of, out of work. And there's some detailers in here going, how soon is that going to happen? Um, it's not going to happen anytime soon, but that's the path we're on, I hope. So uh, this, this little opening slide is kind of what we hear from a lot of junior officers and, and enlisted folks in the fleet. And I want to spend a lot of time talking about uh, maybe a little different view than the one we're all used to. You all know that we, we developed the personnel system that we all work under and operate under, both legally and policy-wise, in 1947. And over 60 years later, we're still operating on that thing. And uh, it's been good to us. It, fair to say, uh, we've had our ups and downs, but overall, uh, we've been pretty successful in this. But when you look at it and what we hear, uh, rather, you know, 1947, after World War II, uh, prior to that, it was, uh, as we like to say, you waited for dead men to, 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 or dead men's shoes before you could move up in the Navy. So we shifted to something where it was up or out. And we had lots of uh, uh, milestones where it was an opportunity to be selected out or you reached a certain point in your retirement and it was time to go. Um, and we replaced it with this. Um, and you, when you look at that, go back to slide, I'm sorry. When you look at that, you go, um, so you got to, you join as a group, we call them your groups, green groups, whatever you want to call them, and you wait your turn, you stand in line, you take a number, uh, and eventually your number comes up and you move on. So it's an industrial age, industrial model of managing people. Uh, and like I said, it's, it's served us well. Now it's, um, it's fair to say that we also have uh, developed a training program l years ago on how to do this, uh, how to be a detailer, how to be a program manager, how to be a, uh, an officer community manager, enlisted community manager. We built this training program, built a video way back when, and actually I remember seeing it. And, and the detailers in the room here, this is their life right now. And uh, why don't you go ahead and, and roll the training video for us. Stein will come in Fine, in you're doing splendidly. <laughs> Speed it up, all! So, you know, the, the, the detailers in Millington understand this concept really well. I mean, I was one, I remember it quite well. And I remember my constituents were always, which piece of chocolate am I? Am I the chocolate that gets picked up and moved on? Or eaten, as it were? Um, or you just fall off a conveyor belt and your career is over. Right, Barry? Yeah. So, I mean, it happens to all of us at some point in our lives. And it's, uh, but all humor aside, this is kind of a reflection of the system we have in place. You wait your turn. And if that conveyor belt's moving, and sometimes it moves slow and sometimes it picks up the pace. And in the end, you wonder if you're going to be picked up uh, and how is that going to be? Is your, is your talent, is your, your skill sets, or your education, do they matter? 
in this kind of style or do we, or do we need to change that style? So even with this kind of system, we're doing all right. We're doing really well. Here's your obligatory aviator slide. Okay, lots of dials, metrics. Uh, I just wish I could fly with it. Instead, I'd sit at my desk. But the overall tenets of what we do in MP MPT and E are all showing that the overall tone is really good and it's getting better. Uh, Admiral Roden talked to it yesterday, I understand. Uh, the vectors are up in a lot of areas. Gaps at sea are way down. Uh, many, many years ago, 2010, we had 17,000 gaps at sea. Today, we're under 2,500. A lot of work's gone into that. A lot of resourcing's got into that by folks in, in Washington, D.C. Your CNO has been incredibly supportive of buying back the people to start filling up the gaps at sea. So we're on a good trajectory on gaps at sea. We're on a better trajectory with health of our enlisted ratings. We're on a better trajectory with officer community health although there are warning signs, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, recruiting is at an all-time high in terms of quality. High school degree uh, uh, graduates and also the uh, testing to enter boot camp, all of those things are at historic highs. Retention is very good across the force. Uh, there are some pockets that we have concern. There always are. Uh, but in general, in the aggregate, recruiting, retention, gaps at sea, all of those things are in great shape. So you, you could argue, why would we want to change? Why not just keep going the way we're going? Well, there are things out there that have us concerned. There are things out there like the global economy, which makes us less in control of our own national economy and our own national future than it has in the past. You've got a Navy and an armed force that's been at war for 13 years and keeps on going. That changes the dynamic sometimes and the attitude about people who look forward and say, where's it going to end? When's it going to end? Uh, do I want to continue at this pace? Long deployments, rapid turnarounds, all the things that were addressed by Admiral Davidson yesterday and Admiral Roden, resetting our, how we operate in the future is going to be really important. So these things are on the horizon. If you go to the next slide, we can we can talk about the things that are very popular here at SNA all day long. And my apologies to the contractors here, but this isn't all about the stuff. I'm here to talk about the people, and it's a bit of a cliche when we say our people are our most important asset. Yet when we get together in, in, in events like this, and Tailhook and everywhere else around every major community, the booths are filled with valves and engines and sensors and weapons. We rarely talk about our people. And that's what we're hopefully going to be able to highlight today, that in the future we've got we to consider not what the Navy of 2025 is. We already know. We're building that. You, what's on the floor and what's in the fleet today is what's going to be in the fleet in 2025. What about the people? What about the sailor of 2025? When do we spend time thinking about who that person ought to be, what that person ought to have in his repertoire, his training, his background, experience? So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, if, we, if we do nothing as a big bureaucracies, and all big bureaucracies have a tendency to steer by the way because it's very safe. I know where I've been. They're, they, they're less likely to want to take risks to somewhere they don't know where they're going. To look on the horizon and say, where, where's the bad weather ahead? Where's the clear air ahead for the institution? And should we dr drive in that direction? Never forgetting what's in our wake, but focusing more on the future. And like I said, I'm, I'm a little uncertain about the future. Historic highs in retention, historic highs in recruiting quality means that will come down at some point. And are we ready for that? Do we have the tools for it? Do we have the personnel system that's flexible and agile enough to deal with what could be a rapidly declining retention rate and a much harder job for our recruiters to get the high quality we've enjoyed for the last 10 years? So we're going to move on and, uh, and talk about the things that are important to us as I look to the horizon, as the organization does. And I'd love for you to, especially the ju junior officers in the crowd and the mid-grade officers in the crowd and any enlisted in the crowd, to think about the questions you want to ask me or have a conversation about what's on the horizon. And I'll, and I'll tee up a little bit of that in the next few slides. Next slide. So who are the folks that we're bringing into the Navy today? Uh, they don't like being called millennials, by the way, and we, we tend to categorize 
uh, anybody from about 18 to almost 40 is a millennial. Um, they, they are very talented. They're certainly smarter than I was, than many of us in the audience were when we came in the Navy. Uh, they're aggressive. They want to be successful. Uh, they're, they have high expectations for the, the company or the organization, in our case, the service that they work for. Uh, and their expectations are, in many cases, they want to be part of a team even more than we wanted to be part of a team. They wanted to be valued as an individual and they wanted opportunities and choice, more so than I remember being at the same point in my life as a junior officer. So when we get them and we bring them into the Navy, what do they expect? Well, when, when they, go ahead, next slide. When they, when, when, when they come in the Navy, we, we gotta understand how do they learn? What's the best way for them to learn? Uh, what opportunities do we give them about their career choices, their career options? Uh, how do we give them an opportunity to grow? That's their expectations, that's how we have to think. As opposed to looking in our wake and saying, this is the way it's always been done, this is the way you're gonna live with it, if you don't like it, get out. And there are pockets of our Navy that do that on a daily basis. Uh, and we're not dealing with some of the more complex issues that come along in a career. If you jump to the next slide, um, how do you, you know, I'm gonna have to raise a family at some point. I wanna raise a family at some point. I wanna go to grad school. I want other opportunities. I want maybe an off-ramp and an on-ramp to service. There are lots of demands that corporate America is dealing with the same generation that they didn't have to deal with, and they are making adjustments. They are our competition for talent. The question for us is, are we making the same adjustment? Are we gonna be able to react and respond to keep the great talent we need in the Navy into the future? That's a real big question, question mark for us. And what I'm gonna lay out here for you are some, are some basic tenets, some pillars of how we're thinking about changing the personnel system and the way we respond to the demands that are coming from these folks. I've been them in three things because that's all I can remember. We gotta modernize, modernize and, be, and have a more innovative personnel system. And we'll talk about, break that out here to a large extent in a minute. Um, learning and training. If, if there's one area that we have very strong feedback from the fleet, especially in the enlisted force, is, is the inefficient and in many cases ineffective way we train and learn. And then on the officer side, sending people to grad school at the right time for them. Uh, is also important. There are communities that do it real well. The surface community is doing a fabulous job of getting their young officers to grad school. I was just up in Newport, spoke to 180 department head, pre-department head folks. Every hand in the room went up when I asked them who'd been to grad school. Shocked me. If that had been 180 pre-department head aviators, two hands would have gone up. Uh, submarine community, I'm not sure. But uh, you, there are, you could argue that we don't, as an institution, value graduate edu education the way we should. When you think about a Rhodes Scholar coming out of the Naval Academy or ROTC program, they go away for two years and they come back to the Navy. Uh, if they're a jet pilot, they got another two and a half years of training. Four and a half years into their career with no fitness reports, they're competing against everybody else. Is that right? Why is it? Well, because they're in that year group. We're gonna track you by year group, not by skill set, talent, ability, milestones. That's the shift that has to occur. So when you add in a different way of looking at how we learn, how we train, how we educate, and then you throw in the hardest part about all this, which is, is the culture that we have. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. So the first one is, what are we thinking about a new personnel system? There's a lot to think about here. Uh, you could argue that we don't have a lot of choice in the Navy today if you're a junior officer. You know what your golden path to command is, if that's what you choose, and you better get on that path and not veer too far away from it, or you're going to lose your place in line. And on that conveyor belt, you'll be the chocolate that gets eaten or fallen off. So we've got to open up more opportunities for choice, more flexible personnel system, officer side, enlisted side, to deal with personal and professional challenges to people who would otherwise be enormously valuable to our institution. The goal here is to keep the best quality of folks that we have, not just the right number of folks we have. 
It may shock you to know that on the enlisted force, we keep on average 12% of the folks that walk through Great Lakes on an annual basis to 20 year career, 12%. But by golly, when you meet with that 12% or that your entire enlisted force at a very young age and you talk about pays and compensation and benefits, um, they'll, they'll just rip your head off if you talk about, don't you screw with my retirement. And I go, which among you are gonna make, who among you are gonna make 20 year career? But it's really, really important to them yet it's only that 12%. The question is, is it the right 12%? And how do we know? Who knows best? Who knows best what the best quality is in the fleet? Is it us in N1, MPT and E, on a PSR or a spreadsheet that we look for 15 seconds to decide whether they're up or down? Or is it the commanding officer of the ship, the squadron, the unit? I believe it's the triad on that ship squadron unit that knows best who the talent is. And we need to give them tools at that level to be able to deal with managing talent and keeping the best quality in the Navy. So every policy we're looking at is focused on driving greater authority to the commanding officer and removing authority from the bureaucracy that governs it right now, okay? Really risky thing to do, but I think it's time. Uh, so expanded choice and flexibility, and then uh, we talked about officer and enlisted detailing a little bit. You know, the enlisted force, I asked this question the other day to the department heads up in Newport. How many six and seven year chief petty officers do we see in the fleet? Are, are, they, are they a unicorn or are they real? And the answer is they're real. How many seven year O4s do we have in the United States Navy? Zero. Why is that? Why do we allow ourselves to have an enlisted force that can perform and test and demonstrate ability and we promote them and advance them and move them along. Because we want that talent, right? We want, it, we want to reward the best talent we can, we move them. We don't do that in the officer community. We go back to the stand in line, wait your turn, and we'll get to you when we get to you, good luck. Okay, it's not a good, good, not a good model. Talk about training, this kind of intersection, or I should say learning, this kind of intersection of training, education, and experience is where we have to focus our energy. We have to understand what's at the intersection person by person. And then, and then customize that training as best we can to the, for the, be, the, the benefit of the individual. This generation wants feedback. They want it on a daily basis, a weekly basis. They don't want it every six months at our required mentoring session or at the lockstep point in time that we do a performance evaluation or a fitness report. Now we do these things because we're a big organization and we need to have structure to make sure we get all the things done we need to do. But my belief is over time, over 60 plus years, that has taken the responsibility of mentors and leaders to really have the authority and the accountability and the responsibility to bring our best talent forward all the time, okay? Training, think about training in the enlisted force. I'm jumping around here, but you'll get my point here in a minute. Today we bring in, out of the depth, which is the delayed entry program pool, where many of our young high school grads and others who sign up and say, I want to enlist in the Navy, they go to the depth for about six months, and we pull those folks out depending on what they signed up for and the demand signal as best we can determine, which is, which is nascent at best at times. Uh, so they come in to the boot, into boot camp, we get them through eight weeks of salarization, throw them into A school depending on their rate. Uh, they go from A school for some length of time, then they go to C school from anywhere from no time to two years before they show up at the water park. And they get all that training for that rate when they're 18, 19, 20 years old. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was 18 or 19, I didn't pay attention very much. And if, if somebody gave me all the training in the world at 18 or 19 years old, it wouldn't be long before it timed out by the time I got to the fleet, okay? But once we're done with that training, in most cases, in the vast majority of our rates, we're done. Good luck, shipmate. I hope you make chief someday. Over to you. Now, they go to sea duty, they start knocking it out of the park, and 
Uh, hopefully they got a great chief petty officer out there who's mentoring and guiding them and showing them the way. Uh, and then they go off to shore duty and they're thinking, ah, I'm going to stay Navy. Um, they go from E4 maybe to E5 on shore duty. Maybe if they're really good, they, they test well and they go to E6. And then we give them orders back to sea. And, and oh, by the way, when they're at shore, they may not be even in a, in a job that's relative to their rate. And so now they come back to a ship and they have two years to three years of time in between, out of rate, and potentially no school on their way back to the fleet as an E6 to go into a leadership position to now train and mentor young guys and gals coming out of boot camp. Hell of a model. Hell of a model. What's frustrating to COs out there today when we say, and we beat our chest proudly, we're at 98% fill and 92% fit in the Navy. Everybody goes, well, that's great, we got more people, but you're not necessarily giving me the guy or gal with the experience and the training, the, all the NECs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And oh, by the way, it's a second or first class petty officer who showed up, hadn't been doing this for a while. Now, if you're an officer in the United States Navy and you go on shore duty after your first sea duty, and it's out of rate, if you will, you come to Washington, D.C., where everything's out of rate, you have to completely change your mind when you come to Washington, D.C. But when we send you back to the fleet, what do we do? You go to the schoolhouse. You get refresh training. You get re-blued. You show up in the, in the ship, in the squadron, ready to go, ready to lead, ready to war fight. Why aren't we doing that with our enlisted force? Could it account for 12% retention to 20 years and not 15% of our best? Could it account for 12% of mediocre talent and not extraordinary talent? Questions for us, we've got to answer. But I do believe, and when I talk to enlisted, the enlisted force out there about a training concept that looks much different than the one we have today, they get pretty excited about it. And so the goal here, the overarching goal for the enlisted side is to shorten street to the fleet training, give them only the training they need to go to that first job, and then hit them over and over again at the waterfront in the best way we can. And this is where we need industry to talk about technology improvements, IT, the ability to track the data source, the data management. All of those things are in great need in our business. But if we do that well and we're able to hit the enlisted sailors at the right time with the right training to make them the best that they can be, Imagine how motivated they'll be to stay on the team. Next slide. And then lastly, uh, you know, 239, 239 years of rich culture and history and traditions um, are important to us. It's what made most of us stay in the business we're in. And it's the people that, that go along with that culture uh, that's important. And there's aspects of our culture, we all know it, that we, we love. We don't want to see disappear. And there, are other, there have been other aspects of our culture that we needed to get rid of and change. And we do change. And we're going to continue to change. We're, we're going to continue to enrich the culture we have through thoughtful processes and approach to doing it. Central among all of that is empowering our COs to give them more authority in command. There are COs in this room, and there are a lot of COs in the fleet, who when we have personal conversations in small group settings, will tell you that I feel less and less like I have the authority I thought I was going to have in command today because we, the big guys up here in Washington, tend to drive requirements that take their time away to war fight, to train, to operate, and to mentor. So our policy reviews, when they come through, ought to be focused on that and solving that. That will enrich our culture in a way we can't even imagine. And the intangible benefits to doing that are what we're really after. Okay, last slide. I think that's it. So it is all about the people. It is not a cliche. Every one of us that has served, is serving, or wants to serve uh, knows that it's all about our people. So we've gotta look forward, we've gotta look past where we've been in front of us and decide, do we change? Is it time for that change? And the answer is yes. There are other people out there thinking about it for us. 
And there's nothing worse than somebody else giving us a bill. There's nothing worse than somebody else telling us how to do our business. But if we don't act, if we don't take bold action, much like the shift from the, all, from the conscription force in the 60s and 70s to the all-volunteer force in 1974, which all of us in uniform fought, thought it was a bad idea, who would trade it today? Nobody. Goldwater Nichols, 1986. We needed a little bit of jointness in our world, didn't we? Well, we're as joint as we're ever going to be today. Is it now time to think about a different personnel system to manage, to have the ability to manage the quality and the talent we need for the future of all this stuff that we're, we're doing a magnificent job of putting together? Over to you. Questions, comments? Here we go. That's, that's either a sign that you're grateful I'm done and it's time to go, or you're just uh, filling in the void. Thank you. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Good morning, sir. Lieutenant Gaines, LCS Ron. Uh, my question is, uh, actually, I have two questions. First, um, LCS is a you know, new animal the Navy's playing with. And I know that at LCS Ron and uh, in Millington, there's a lot of uh, talk and a lot of uh, hand-holding and trying to get the right people into LCS. Um, the LCS screening that they all have to do, a uh, couple of times we've had sailors come in to LCS run and that screening form has either been incomplete or they've completely utterly failed uh, this screening form. My question would be, who do we hold responsible for people when they fail those screenings? Is it the losing command or do we punish the sailor for not completing the form or not being physically fit, ready to come and do this thing that they already knew about? Um, so I'm all about punishing people. So uh, <laughs> here's what I'll tell you. That, that is how we, w w how we have to respond in the system we have today. We've got to hold somebody accountable for not keeping the conveyor belt moving and, and the right quality chocker coming off that conveyor belt. If we change the system so that it's not just about LCS or F-35 or the next new thing, that we purposefully sit down and handpick the best talent that we can to go to those new systems so they don't fail. If that applied across the force, how much better would we be? We wouldn't be having to deal with people who can't maintain the standards or can't meet the standards or don't qualify or don't screen. I'll leave it to Dave Steinle and his team down in Millington to talk about how they go through that process and then what they do. But in my view, until you empower COs to make those decisions, to give them the authority to to do the things they need to do, to give them the opportunity to send people to training when they think they need to, as opposed to when the system is able to, um, then you're never going to fix this problem. So more authority down low to give them more options. And uh, Tom Roden is all over this in the service community. I really admire where the service community has invested time and, tr and energy and money into updating their training system and their training systems. You, uh, LCS is a model for this that we need to spread across the force. Um, it, it's going to take money. It's going to take imagination. We've got to break down the, the walls we've built up around A schools and C schools and all of those structures uh, because that's the way we've always done it and shift to a, a different model. Otherwise, we'll, we'll have these problems no matter what the platform is. So I, I'm not going to answer the, clearly I'm dancing all over your your question, because I don't think it's fair to try to, to try to hold those people accountable right now when the system puts up all kinds of barriers to uh, allow a commanding officer and his chain of command to deal with folks that want to go do that, whether it's LCS or F-35, whatever it is. What was part two of your question? Uh, it had to do with the retirement, proposed retirement changes coming up, sir. Yeah. Um, I know that we owe the... Uh, upper chain of uh, you know, response later on in May, sir, but with the uh, proposed changes coming up, um, I know that a lot of people are wondering, are they going to be grandfathered in? Are the people who, you know, two years from now when they enter, if this uh, system has not been fully implemented, are they going to be forced to pay into it? Or are they also going to be added in? Um, th I guess my question really is that, that grandfather, and where would that line be drawn? Yeah, um, all great questions. First of all, we're all going to know at the same time, on February 1st or 2nd, I think, Mr. Secretary, they're coming out. So, yeah. So we're, we're getting close. And, and so we have some insight into what we think they're going to announce, but
but we don't have the full insight. And even if I did, um, it'd be d it, I, I would be telling you half truths and not the full amount. So we're going to find out together. And then you're right, we're going to have 60 days to put a response together uh, before it goes to the White House from DOD. So on, I think it's April 1st, we have to send, the DOD has to send its response to whatever the commission puts out. Um, some t core tenants that were uh, uh, both, I think, approved or at least considered by the, the commission and, and made very strong um, direction from and recommendations from the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Department of Defense was whatever you come up with, the provision for grandfathering must be in place because we have a contract with you all. You joined under an expectation for a retirement program that had X to it. Uh, and so we have to live up to that. I think, I don't think Congress, frankly, is going to take that one on. Um, I think more importantly is if the system they propose is better than the one we have, there needs to be an opt-in clause so that people on both sides don't feel like one's getting a better shake than the other. So uh, we'll find out, but I, I'm, um, I, I, would, I would venture to guess, and it's a guess, um, that get grandfathering for anybody who's wearing a uniform today who has signed a contract to, to serve in the United States Navy today will have the retirement program you know today. Okay? Thank you, sir. Thanks for the question. Yes, sir. Good morning, Admiral. Uh, Bill McKinley, uh, Center for Surface Combat Systems. Um, really appreciate your remarks. Uh, we're developing, we're aligned in developing a plan to systemically and analytically look at all our rates to try and enact uh, your vision. Um, many of us in this room bear the scars of the last revolution in training and uh, are interested in how we're going to avoid repeating the mistakes of the past as we go through this next innovative look at the way we do the training business. Yeah, great, uh, Bill, great question. Uh, I, we do hear that a lot from uh, especially some of the senior enlisted and folks who have been around for a while and, and bore the brunt of us uh, basically carving out the instructor bill and turning it over to CBT training. That's what you're referring to. Uh, Fleet Beldo and I, I'm sorry, Fleet, come on up here. Jeez, I, I, I made the biggest mistake in my career in not introducing Fleet April Beldo, who's been with me for the entire tour and a terrific lady. She can answer a lot of these questions too. So my hat's off to her. <laughs> so she, she was on a panel yesterday. I'm not sure if this came up or not, this issue training did. So um, we, so this is, this is a classic case of a great idea that demonstrated an asset. And then people with the money said, I like that asset. I'll take that asset before we were ready. And the technology wasn't ready. We hadn't thought about the full continuum of training, I don't think, well enough. And so after a few years of not so good results and a lot of feedback from the fleet, especially senior enlisted and instructors at every level, that hey, this CBT thing ain't working out real well. We need to get instructors back in the classroom, need a mix of it. Uh, we spent a lot of time over the last several years buying back those instructors. So now we gotta get the framework right and then decide what technology supports that framework then we're not gonna get rid of an instructor until we understand the full impact to what that technology can do. So if you move away a uh, significant amount of training out of the schoolhouses for the length of time that they are in schoolhouses today, and you modularize it and you bring it to the waterfront, you're still gonna need people to instruct that. It ought not to be a bill to the ship, to the unit. Uh, so we're gonna have to protect those instructors as we build the training systems that are able to come to the waterfront so that those sailors can get that just-in-time training. Um, or otherwise, we'll pay a huge TDY bill by the ship uh, to send sailors back to the schoolhouse, which is inefficient in every measure. So th the framework has to work. It has to be well thought out. And we've got to get all the resource sponsors lined up and agree and march down this path together. That's the only way it's going to work. Mandating it from us, demonstrating an asset, only to see the asset disappear to buy something else, is a recipe for disaster. Good morning, sir. Uh, Emily Bassett, XO of USS Arlington. Hey, Emily, how are you? Good well, to see sir. you again. Yes, sir. Um, question for you, sir. Um, how receptive is the civilian leadership on the Hill um, to changing some of to the discussion about changing some of the statutory requirements that drive a lot of uh, our timing requirements? 
Yeah, uh, they're receptive to listening to ideas, new ideas, um, and, I'll, and I'll only speak for the members of the, the staff, the professional staff that I've met with. They're receptive, they listen. Uh, they're good listeners on this. Um, I think they are, uh, um, there, there's a good reason to wait on the commission's report to find out what's in there that may uh, provide some ideas and solutions for the future. Uh, I, I think the commission's report is really about pay and compensation, not the personnel system. And if we don't do these together, uh, we'll, we'll get out of alignment, especially if, if some of those recommendations are approved eventually by Congress. We need to have a more flexible personnel system to deal with what's in that recommendation from the MCRMC. So uh, their conversation back to me, and rightfully, is, hey, I understand that you're thinking of changes to the law, to DOTMA, to other policies and law that's out there, but fully understand what your policy limits are before you ask for that help. And so we, that's the path we're on right now, is to try to do all of this, all of that that I talked about inside our own policy levers. And I gotta tell you, after looking at it now for a few months, we, we do not take a lot of risk in, in interpreting policy the way we could. And so I think what you'll see from us, or what you'll hear from us, is trying to stretch that, trying to do things within our own lifelines. Because the other, the other challenge here is the, the Navy and the Marine Corps and the Air Force and the Army all have different challenges, all have different aspirations for the youthfulness of their force, the technical aspirations of the force, and, and so it, one size doesn't fit all. And so policies that we own, we, all, we have to go get. And, and so that's, that's the path we're on. And, if there, and then if we need help from Congress, then we go through the normal process and try to, try to see if they uh, are willing to help us. And I think they are. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Admiral. Admiral, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Sorry, Max Cooper, PMS 339, Surface Training Systems. A question involves the uh, requirements now for commissioning through ROTC programs. I was commissioned through ROTC and I double majored in history and, and religion, which, uh, and now I understand there is the- Now uh, you're an engineer. No, sir, not even close. <laughs> My understanding now is that they've changed the requirements for ROTC in that the uh, numbers, the percentages must uh, be are higher uh, for engineering and the STEM type backgrounds, and that if you want to major in liberal arts, uh, liberal arts field, you're less likely to receive a, com um, a scholarship and then subsequent commission. And it seems from my perspective, sir, that that's limiting the potential pool of applicants and going to create in the future a very uh, specific set of, uh, specific mindset within our officer community uh, where basically I think the numbers are 75 percent are going to basically be trained to think like engineers. And that doesn't seem like the sort of broad uh, spectrum of thinking that we've tend to encouraged in the past, and if you could just offer some of your thoughts there on why those the why the requirement was put in place. Yeah, uh, there is no requirement in place. Uh, we had a debate last budget cycle. Uh, we're, we're all looking to save money. ROTC that program's got a lot of money in it, uh, and we if you look at our ROTC program scholarship program uh, and compare it against the the other services, ours is a much richer, more rewarding better program to attract young men and women in our service. Uh, there was a, there is always, there's a constant debate, I, I probably is probably the best way to frame it, uh, between the requirements of NR and uh, that high tech skill set that we need to bring in great young engineering minds into that field. We cannot take risk in having the right numbers of folks to grow that force. Uh, so there is always a debate and tension between uh, between the high tech requirements of the Navy and the more rounded uh, discussion that you, that you had. So we had this debate, we made some proposals. Uh, we were looking to find cash to do other things with inside our own domain. Uh, and it was moving along pretty good until it got to senior leadership, including the Secretary of the Navy who said, no, go back to start and come up with a different idea. So he's not willing to take that risk right now, and so we are not doing what you read about. It was discussed, it was debated, but we have not taken the steps to change the requirement. So the ROTC program is where it was a year ago, two years ago, uh, and it'll continue to be debated about what's the right balance. I will tell you as an English major, uh, and you as a history major, 
Admiral Gortney's a history major from the great school of Elon, North Carolina. Uh, we'll tell you, you know, I, I studied, observed, admired, and respected guys like Jim Stockdale who were not engineering majors. And it got him through almost eight years of extraordinary hell. Um, it gets, you have to have a balance in our, in our leadership continuum. We have to have a balance in our wardroom. It can't be all one side or the other. So I'm with you on your, your, the premise of your question. And my answer to you is we have not changed ROTC and we'll continue to debate this, uh, my guess is every year as we go forward. Mr. Secretary, you want to add anything to that? Okay. So he's, he's, my, he's my huckleberry on this. He keeps me honest. And uh, we're, not, we're, we're on a good path for ROTC. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, Admiral. Uh, John Freeman, Cubic Defense Systems, Orlando. Uh, great article in uh, Navy Times about uh, the overhauling. Uh, of course, one of the uh, notions that you mentioned there, I'm sure, uh, is going to be quite a hurdle, as you articulated, and, and that is uh, the sort of the concept of pooling of resources, and that sort of, uh, you know, hits horizontally across all those cylinders of excellence uh, across mm -hmm. the Pentagon. Uh, curious as to how those discussions are going and, uh, and where you might be, anything you can share with us along those lines. Yeah, the, uh, so we're building towards a, uh, a brief to CNO and the Secretary on, a, on the concept uh, to try to get it starting to lay, uh, I call them pavers, into the POM, POM 17. So uh, you can agree about words all day long. The, the real proof in the pudding is whether anybody puts money in the game. So we have to get into the POM. So we're, we've constructed the framework. We are having the discussion. I would tell you that the resource sponsors individually, as I talk to them, completely understand the training concept here and the framework. They want in, but now we've got to demonstrate how you do that. So th the issue, and you rightfully pointed it out, is how do you govern this? Where's the integrator for the stovepipes of uh, technology development, training system development, training design, training science? Where is that integrator? Where should it be, and how should we govern ourselves inside of that? So we have great examples of enterprises out there today that work really well when you put the resource sponsors, the fleet, and the folks that have to implement whatever it is uh, together in a room and agree that we're heading down the path that the framework is designed for. Uh, that's, that's the secret sauce in this that we have to get through. Uh, and I think once, once leadership f buys into this, uh, then we can start laying a foundation with the money to move in that direction. And each one's gonna have to be paced early on, it's gonna have to be paced differently. We're not gonna just switch the light on in training overnight, it's gonna take time. We may need to do, and there are some piloting efforts going on right now at NETSI. Admiral White is taking this on. We're trying to understand how far we can go and how fast we can go. And then we can start laying that in and show the cost of doing it. Uh, so that's, that's all work to be done. Uh, and I would tell you that uh, we're, we're fully committed to this. Got a lot of support across the fleet and the uh, TICOMs completely buy into it, but they don't have to write a check just yet. Uh, it, it will come down to who writes the checks. Thanks. Yes, sir, thank you. You bet. Yes, sir. Good morning, Admiral. Thank you for your remarks and your vision as you laid it out. Question as regards the active and reserve components. Mm -hmm. Do you envision any changes in force structure mixes, the balance between the two, or mission assignments? Uh, too early to tell in a force structure. Uh, that's really not my lane, but I, from a policy perspective, uh, when I talked earlier about developing things that allow us to have off-ramps and on-ramps of service, whether you're officer or enlisted. Now, we, don't, we do not take advantage of policies that exist today to allow people to take a break from active service uh, and go off and, and stay in the reserve so they are immediately and easily recallable, or if they want to come back on active duty on their own, they can. We, we have not institutionalized that yet. We've got about, I don't know, 300, Dave, three or 400 uh, enlisted folks that have come from a, uh, RC to AC, uh, very little of it on the officer front. But imagine if we had that free flow of opportunity through the right policies that does not um, disadvantage officers that choose to go into the RC for two years to take care of a parent, to start a different job, look if the grass is greener on the other side, uh, get a higher education on there, whatever they wanna do, but they come back on active service. If we just throw them right back in the year group they left with, they're done. Okay, so this goes back to that whole year group management thing is old 
school industrial style that we have to get our arms around and change the policy. So I see the RC AC mix piece being much more about how you fully integrate RC into the active force. It's going to be very hard, and I'm sure you heard this from the resource sponsors yesterday, very hard to build out infrastructure for the reserves and every one of the new capabilities we have out there. Far easier to take men and women and, and integrate them inside the active force in a more meaningful way. This is a discussion Admiral Braun and I are having, and she, uh, she is very open to the ideas to make sure that the viability of the reserve force is what they, it, it fits in nicely to the needs of the active force. Because the, at the end of the day, uh, we've got to be able to make sure the active force is whole and fully supported by the reserve force. And they've done a magnificent job over the last 13 years in exactly that fashion. But now as we come off of that footing, what then? How do, how do we utilize the reserves? And that, I think that's, this is an opportunity to have those kinds of discussions. Thanks. Yes, sir. Hey. Uh, Captain Eric Weiss, Navy Appropriations Eric, Liaison. So when I try to mentor junior officers about continuing education, it seems to me they're in the Navy, we have a, a lack or a lack of connection between our pursuit of continuing education and what I call education with a purpose. I kind of backed it, just using my own example, it was a NFO, um, kind of backed into a budget career. Mm -hmm. We don't really counsel junior officers to get education, but then pursue that subspec. We, we tend to pursue subspecialties, like Boy Scouts pursue merit badges. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be interesting, you know, a subspecialty with a purpose. You, I, I do acquisition when I'm not flying airplanes. I do budget when I'm not flying airplanes. Yeah. So can you share your vision of the future with? Well, this? I think that, yeah, Eric, thank you. Uh, it does fit nicely into the notion that you value people's experience their, their proven ability, and whether they've reached milestones within their community, their warfighting community, that's when you determine whether they're ready for the next step. Imagine a world where you promote into your proven ability and your uh, readiness uh, based on milestone achievement to move to the next level, much like we do in the enlisted force, in the officer community. Now, everybody in here has been a detailer, and I know the detailers are going, man, it's going to make my head hurt. We've got to give them the tools to be able to do it, and we don't today. So that's a big part of, of the vision is the IT backbone, the infrastructure, the data mining, the data, data assessment that's at the hands of detailers, but also, to go to my original point at the start, to put us out of business, to make it a market-based approach. And everybody in here who's an old dog is going to go, man, you're crazy. Th th that's, that, we're just going to you know, go into chaotic uh, detailing if we do that. I don't think so. I really don't. Um, we've seen pockets of where this has been done in the Army very well. Uh, and granted, the Army is not the Navy. They don't have sea duty uh, challenges, all that kind of stuff. But there, there's a direction that we can take. It goes to your point about um, you, you bring skill sets, experiences, and those sorts of things to you, and you're left at the whim of your, again, your timing and the availability of those jobs and the system uh, good detailers, and we got a lot of them, they, they deliberately try to get you into that job because of your background and experience. And so we're doing more and more subspec coding and AQD coding to try to get our arms around it, but we're fitting it inside of a system that's pretty old. So we're trying to modern, we, we need to modernize that along with the information systems that go with it uh, to be better. Yes, sir. Thanks. Yes, sir. Uh, either one, I can't. Uh, morning, Admiral. Uh, uh, Craig Turley from Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, could you briefly comment on your thoughts on flexibility for giving junior officers in all unrestricted line communities the flexibility to pursue graduate education, just not at MPS, but in their career? Thank you. Yeah, Craig, thank you. Um, so graduate education has to be for our best. I think that's the fundamental shift that has to occur. Uh, I think the aviators in the crowd, Eric, you just stood up. It's if you are lucky enough to be not in a position to do what we want you to do, that you go to grad ed. I see the service community much more deliberate about this, and they've opened up windows of opportunity to send their best. Those who have taken the bonus, for example, or have signed up for uh, the next milestone and have demonstrated a commitment 
and have been selected by a board to go to the next milestone, that's, that's kind of the sifting of the quality. Those folks are going to NPS, so you're getting high quality out of the service community going to NPS. I don't think I can say with confidence that you're getting it from all the other communities. Um, so we have to do a better job of, uh, of truly valuing that as a, uh, a something that every, and, and you talk to any officer in the Navy and they're going to tell you, yeah, I'd love to go to grad school. Yeah, I'd love to go to NPS. Yeah, I'd like to go to Harvard, Wharton, you name it. Um, but I don't have time in my career to do it in many cases. Uh, or I'm going to get behind the rest of my peers and um, I don't want to take that risk because I, I want to make a career out of this. So my, the flexibility and option piece is open up policy that allows us to reset year groups if we have to in the interim or do away with year groups past the 10 year mark, for example. And once you're in the control grade, we're managing you by your milestone development and proven uh, ability to move to the next level. And we could promote you into XO or, or, uh, or department head much earlier than we do today if you're ready and you want to go and it, and it allows you to sequence all of those other things you want to do, start a family, uh, break apart if you're a dual military couple, break apart your sea duty and shore duty rotations. The, now, detailers work that day in and day out and, it, and it's tough work. Uh, but we're not giving them the policy or the freedom to do it more liberally. And, and that's, that's, that's the challenge in developing this new system as we go forward. Thank you, sir. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Sir, Bill so, Burns, Institute for Defense Analysis. Uh, you mentioned that retention is good these days. I wondered if you could speak specifically to surface warfare officer retention uh, numbers, quality, and, and where you're needing to uh, use incentives. Sure can. I'm glad you, you must have listened to my phone call this morning. Um, so uh, 20 years ago, surface uh, ju junior officer retention was 28%. Today, it's just a hair under 40%. That's a significant improvement. Now, 20 years ago, where were we? End of the 90s? Everybody remember the end of the 90s? Navy was not a great place to be. Uh, we were downsizing. Uh, we had significant force reductions. Uh, economy was booming. It's hard to keep people in, hard to get people to come in. Uh, so could we repeat that cycle? It's very possible. And that's my worry. Uh, so what's gotten us to 40%? Is it just great leadership? Is it just luck of timing in the economy? Or is it deliberate steps to try to improve the quality of service for our young men and women in the surface force? I think it's all of the above. It's not one or the other. Um, but we need to know what were the key components that drove us to a better retention rate. We, we still need to get higher than that because department head requirements aren't going away, they're actually growing. And if you're going to get to those numbers with the same population that's coming in, you got to improve retention to get there. So we, the, and Admiral Roden knows this. We've had several rich conversations about how to get there, what he needs. And much of what we've talked about uh, and the feedback from the junior officers is where I, 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 most, uh, I get most of that uh, positive response is, if you go in that direction, you give me more choice, more options, um, I'm more inclined to stay with the team because it's my choice. I get to make those decisions because I've got more options. Um, so we're at f about 39 point some percent today. We've been hovering around 38 to 40 percent for the last five years. So we're doing well. I'd like to see us get in the 42, 43, 44 uh, percent. And, and I, I think we'd be real healthy. So. Um, and that's under the industrial model. If we have a more nimble approach to it, we might be able to do a lot better than that. Thanks for your question. That sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.